Hi, folks. Welcome. We'll get started in another couple moments to let folks hop on. Welcome, welcome, everybody. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. And thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's Art on Thursdays presents All That Glitters is Gold, Gustav Klimt. Austrian painter Gustav Klimt is associated with a number of artist movements, including Art Nouveau and symbolism, but in the end, he developed a distinctive style all his own. This program introduces audiences to the idiosyncratic artist and reviews his famous gold paintings as well as his lesser known works. To introduce our presenter tonight, we have Jane O'Neill, who is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Currier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information, I will link this down below in the chat. Um, please visit I'm Culturally Curious com. Speaking of the chat, any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation tonight, just please feel free to pop those in the chat or the Q&A section in your Zoom menus at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jane. Thank you so much, Gianna. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day and your busy holidays to learn a little bit more about Gustav Klimt. Somehow the gold just felt right for this time of year. And so I'm glad you agreed and, um, and showed up tonight. So, um, so tonight, we'll be looking at this artist whose work really will take us um, sort of out of the traditions of the 1800s, or I'm sorry, the 1900s, and sort of giving way to the progress and modernity of, of the, the 1900s, of the 20th century. Uh, as was mentioned in the program description, Clint is oftentimes categorized as a symbolist artist or an art nouveau artist. He was both of those things and more. I try to point out some of those characteristics along the way. In the end, he really kind of developed a style that was all his own, and really nobody has has attempted to emulate it to the same degree of, uh, um, as as the peak of his career, this gold period that we'll be looking at. So you probably already know that Klimt's primary subject was the female body. He painted it, he drew it, um, he was fascinated by it, and his works are marked by this sensuality and oftentimes eroticism. We will see that that gets him into a lot of trouble <laughs> along the way. So let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this hour together. Um, we are going to start off with the life and times, really the early times of Gustav Klimt. And then we'll talk a little bit about his role in the Vienna secession and a few scandals that he uh, uh, encountered or maybe encouraged before um, he arrived at the gold period, which I think most people are, are sort of best familiar with uh, when it comes to his body of work. And then we'll wrap up with his death and legacy. When I put this whole program together, it was about a hundred slides and I had to edit it down. And I, I regret to say that I had to take out his landscapes. So um, his landscapes are magical in their own right. We are looking at a painting called The Birch Forest from 1903. It sounds like I might need to do a Gustav Klimt part two at some point because the landscapes are, are wonderful. But let's get started with the life and times of Gustav Klimt. All right. We've got our map here. We've got a little image of, uh, of Vienna, Austria from about 1890. And the map here is to just uh, give you a sense in terms of where he was in the world. He was born in 1862 and uh, born into the, uh, the Austrian Hungarian empire. So Vienna was really one of the biggest cities in the empire and he was born just outside of it. Sort of like a country bumpkin, to be honest, he was out in the hinterlands and he came from, um, well, we'll get, we'll get a little bit more into his background in just a moment. But what I really wanted to emphasize with this slide, with this image of, of what Austrian life looked like at the time was really um, how 
unique Vienna was in all of Europe, really. It was the least industrialized city um, in Europe uh, right around the turn of the century. So in some ways, it was sort of backwards. Um, it was a very conservative environment, conservative politically, artistically, and socially. It was not a, a place that really welcomed or encouraged change. It was also this fascinating crossroads for major figures of the 20th century. So while Gustav Klimt is there, you know, Hitler comes through, and of course, Sigmund Freud was born there and lived there his whole life. Uh, you even have Leon Trotsky coming through too. So all of these uh, major thinkers are kind of drawn to this area. Uh, of course, it's like a, an important nexus point during World War II. So we'll kind of talk about the afterlife of some of these paintings as we go along. But I just wanted to reinforce this idea that Gustav Klimt was working in an environment that was not necessarily conducive to um, to risk taking, <laughs> to, uh, to different modes of thought. And I think that will make him and his work all the more remarkable as we go along. So as I mentioned, here he is in, in, um, as a young man. He was born outside of Vienna in 1862. He was one of seven children and they were essentially impoverished. He and his two brothers both went into the arts and probably the reason behind that was because their father was a gold engraver. Yes, gold. So gold uh, factors into his life very early on. And I'm sure there was some sort of interest in the arts that was sort of instilled by his father. So Gustav Klimt at the age of 14 won a full scholarship to art school. And as we'll see, it, it becomes very clear that he studied and worked very hard while he was there. So, um, so right after he graduates, he and one of his brothers and a friend of theirs, so this is uh, Gustav Klimt here, this is his brother Georg, and this is their friend uh, Franz Match. Uh, they formed a business called a company of artists and they uh, they begin to receive some commissions all around Vienna. Uh, Gustav Klimt had sort of specialized in architectural decoration. So he was really interested in kind of unifying a space into a total work of art. And then this little company that they have scores the ultimate commission. And this is only about three to five years after he graduates from art school, they get this unparalleled opportunity at the Berg Theater in Austria. And so we're looking at this magnificent building where, you know, really the upper echelon of society gathers. Um, so it's a building itself that's already in the, the limelight and then you're getting your artwork in front of, um, you know, possible customers. So these three young artists get this opportunity and they are commissioned to paint murals on the ceilings of both of these uh, kind of axial wings of the building. And I wanted to give you a, a quick glimpse in terms of what this early work looked like because we'll see the seed for some of his, um, his interests later on, but we'll also see that he starts in a pretty conservative vein of painting. So let's go inside. We're going to see the uh, sort of a floor to ceiling on one side and just the ceiling of the other uh, with this next slide here. So you can see that those giant wings are really just a giant staircase and that we see there's very elaborate decoration on the ceilings in both of these spaces. Now the, um, the organizing principle for these murals that they painted, and I call them murals, but I believe that they are oil paintings on canvas that were then affixed to the ceiling. I don't think he was up there painting on scaffolding like Michelangelo. So the organizing principle here was the, the evolution of theater. And one of the uh, one of the several paintings that Gustav Klimt was uh, responsible for, for this commission, was this tympanum over here on the left. It's like this little, almost like a half moon shaped uh, painting. And we zero in on it here. And the subject is the altar of Dionysus. So the God of wine, <laughs> everything sort of st gets started with getting drunk. I guess that's the origin of theater, right? So we see already Gustav Klimt is painting um, a sort of beautiful nude women sort of luxuriating here, but these are classicized nudes. These are kind of safe nudes in the history of art. Notice that these nudes have no body hair. Body hair will become a major issue in Gustav Klimt's uh, body of work, but they are sort of um, 
Well, they're they they're luxurious. They're uh, um, they they sort of bring you into this picture. As we zoom in just a little bit closer, we can see that this woman here is holding an offering to this bust, a golden bust of Dionysus, and the offering here is a little figurine of Pallas Athena or the goddess of wisdom. So um, we'll see a, a couple of different versions of the goddess of wisdom kind of come up again in Gustav Klimt's work. So we already have the gold, we have the, the naked ladies and Pallas Athena. Very quickly, I just wanted to show you one other major painting that he um, worked on as part of this commission. And I think it will help you see just, I mean, how well educated he was uh, when he went to art school. So this is his depiction of the Globe Theatre in London. Remember, the whole uh, cycle is about the evolution of theatre. And so if we look over here on the stage, we can see this is the suicide scene at the end of Romeo and Juliet. He's also suggesting that the Virgin Queen herself is sitting right there on the stage in like this place of honor. Now, there are some things that he got wrong. I, I guess um, Queen Elizabeth never said uh, on the stage, she had a, a better seat. Uh, we all we can also see that there are very well dressed figures with like these rough collars uh, right there in the front. Of course, if you know anything about Shakespeare, that's where the groundlings were. They weren't that well dressed, but these figures bring our eyes back to the crowd in the distance. And if we zoom in on them we can see a self-portrait by Gustav Klimt wearing Elizabethan dress. This is his brother just behind him, and this is their colleague Franz Match. So he's included all of the artists who are working on this commission right here in the painting. It's said that um, several other uh, Klimt family members are depicted there too. Now, interestingly, Gustav Klimt said he never painted a self-portrait. He said, and I quote, <laughs> I never painted a self-portrait. I am less interested in myself as a self subject for painting than I am in other people, above all, women. <laughs> so let's turn our attention to Gustav Klimt and women. Prepare to pick your jaw up off the floor. Are you ready? Okay, so Gustav Klimt, we are looking at two different views of his studio. Gustav Klimt lived with his mother and his unmarried sisters his entire life, but he did rent a studio, and this is where he sort of had his privacy. You'll notice in this studio that there is a bed. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen another stu artist studio arranged this way. So in this studio space, this is where Gustav Klimt um, would pay for models to come. And these models would oftentimes become his mistresses. And so he um, had these very discreet affairs with many women. And it is said that he fathered 14 children with various women out of wedlock over the course of his life. So we now know, obviously, uh, posthumously, that he had these very strong sexual appetites and his, his studio space sort of afforded him this opportunity to indulge that way. Now you might be thinking 14 kids, like how did this all work? Apparently he was um, invested in them, at least uh, around the time that they were young. He became very wealthy as an artist and know that he did spend money to support them. He would write letters inquiring how some of these kids were doing. But um, for the most part, the, the person he was most attached to in his life was this young woman here. And her name was Emily Floge. Emily Floge, this is a portrait of her done when she was 18 years old, the year that Gustav Klimt met her. He was six years older than her. He met Emily Floge um, because she was the sister of the woman that Gustav Klimt's brother was marrying. So essentially she's his sister-in-law. <laughs> and from that developed what is said to have at first, at first, um, at least at first, have been some sort of real infatuation with her that maybe kind of cooled down to a close friendship. Um, in fact, these two became lifelong companions. They vacationed together, they attended important events together, and as we'll see, they even collaborated professionally because Emily Floge grows up to become a fashion designer. And here are two views of her wearing one of her own designs. And so here we are coming out of buttoned up, prim and proper Victorian Vienna, 
And here's Emily Floge doing uh, what, what is essentially like, this is the first wave of fe feminism. This is Victorian dress reform. It's getting rid of corsets. It's like these flowing gowns that are much more comfortable to wear and really interesting to look at. And she was very successful at this. She and her sisters ran a couture um, fashion uh, 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 store in Vienna for 30 years. So she was a great designer and a great businesswoman. So sometimes she and, and Gustav Klimt would even collaborate too. So uh, they they were interested in the same things professionally. Oftentimes Floge would dress the women that, that um, Gustav Klimt would later undress, but um, dress the women that he was painting. And, um, and, and we can see that she also functioned as a model and a muse to the artist too. This is a portrait that he did of her in 1902. And we can see we've come a long way from the Berg Theater already. Um, we're, we're not as interested in creating an image that, that looks um, uh, incredibly three-dimensional here because certainly this fantastic dress that Emily Floge is wearing here that we see in full length three-quarter profile, this is a dress that, that sort of functions to kind of flatten out the whole picture. We don't even see her curves per se, that's part of the dress design, but the pattern here tends to flatten out the picture. There's also this incredible collar behind her head. There's this, um, there's this wonderful confrontation in her expression and we can see how the, her skin, her face, her flesh really pops out against the abstract patterning of this gown. Incidentally, her mother hated this portrait, um, but, but we can see that perhaps there's some cross pollination between Floge and Klimt here. Now, Gustav Klimt himself had very interesting clothing choices. Here he is wearing one of his signature caftans. <laughs> and he would wear this not just for work, he would wear it a lot of the time. This is a man who was trying to tell the world that he rejected bourgeoisie expectations, right? <laughs> and, and values, really. This is this kind of unadorned Spartan look, you know, I mean, it's essentially a bag, it's a sack. Um, Apparently he did oftentimes wear this while he was painting and it was fairly well known that he wore nothing underneath it, which is probably the reason that he had so many children. <laughs> but um, people think of him engaged in the creative act of painting for the most part when they think of him in these caftans. Um, a few of them are still preserved in museum collections and um, and because uh, uh, he, was, he, he, he painted in them, they are really, thought to have this kind of aura to them now, like these special caftans. They are, they're famous in their own right as his signature look. Now, here's just one last glimpse of him and Emily Floes. You can tell that they're just two peas in a pod here, caftan, modern dresses. There are nearly 400 surviving letters from Gustav Klimt to Emily Floes, and he hated to write letters. Um, but those letters really uh, attest to this intimate, an intellectually stimulating friendship that they had. It's um, it's really impossible to say if, if their relationship was ever consummated, but it does just seem to be a friendship. Uh, now, in terms of Gustav Klimt's attachments, he was also known to be very attached to his pets. And he had, I think it's safe to say, dozens of cats. <laughs> so here he is in a famous photograph wearing one of the caftans with a cat here, and the cat is appropriately named Cats, K-A-T-Z. Um, there's a famous story of an art critic going to his studio um, to interview him, and in that room alone there were like 10 different cats, and they're like fighting with each other and shredding up his, his studies and that sort of thing. And Gustav Klimt apparently said something pretty strange to that critic about these cats. He said, their urine makes Makes great fixative. So he was okay with the smell, he was okay with the cats. Um, it becomes part of the lore of Gustav Klimt. So we wrap up on him with just a couple of big ideas here. He was um, a, an immensely talented and successful painter who did not follow the norm um, throughout his life. His choices, as we'll see, bring him great success. He's born into poverty, and by the, you know, by the height of his career, he's making Ten, uh, 10 times uh, what a, a school teacher might make in an entire year by selling just one 
painting. So he's very successful. So tonight we'll learn a little bit more about his body of work and how, um, like I said, he oftentimes brushed up against a, a great deal of scandal because of these passionate uh, ideas that he had and these very progressive and modern ideas. So let's turn our attention to scandal and secession here. Now, just after the Berg Theater Commission, Gustav Klimt is like rolling in, in the dough, rolling in the commissions. Everybody who saw his, his contributions to the Berg Theater wants a portrait done. And we can see in the 1890s that he is producing um, realistic portraits, strikingly realistic portraits. I love this image of the woman over here on the right. I feel like she's right there in the room with me judging me slightly. <laughs> but beyond the realism of these works, I want to draw attention to the backgrounds in both of them. Because over on the left, we can see like the, the edge of a tapestry maybe, but we get this kind of geometric flat abstraction here, maybe a little bit of gold. And in the background over here, once again, this kind of modern floral motif, slightly abstracted, and once again, in the gold. So we see this interest in gold kind of popping out even early on. Now, at the same time that he's producing portraits like this, something in his life very much liberates him. So he's already already met Emily Flo. She's being, you know, they're they're sort of um, um, sharing ideas. But at this time, his brother, who he had worked with at the Berg Theater, and his father pass away. And it sort of just opens up possibilities for Gustav Klimt. And he begins to explore um, artistically in a way that he, he never had before. Um, unfortunately, he was also then tasked with supporting his mother's family and his brother's family. So luckily he becomes incredibly successful with these, uh, with these brave choices that he's making. So one of the things that he does during the 1890s towards the end of the decade is he is involved with a movement called the Vienna Secession. And to boil it down in the most simple terms, essentially, this is a group of, of artists, uh, more uh, avant-garde artists, who are rejecting the, the conservative nature of the artistic establishment in Vienna. So they secede from them and say, we're going to do our own thing because we are embracing, you know, creativity and, um, and avant-garde movements. So Gustav Klimt all of a sudden becomes the president of this movement. And I love this photograph over here on the left because we can see that these members of the Vienna secession still look pretty buttoned up and prim and proper, but then you have Gustav Klimt sitting over here, looking a mess, wearing a caftan. <laughs> At this point, he's already internationally known as an artist, but he wasn't somebody who was um, especially social. Like I said, he had this kind of private life in his studio with these women. Um, and he wasn't like out at cafes with other artists, like debating philosophy or anything like that. But he is at the head of this particular movement. On the right, we can see uh, sort of the permanent building for the Vienna Secession movement. And it's a strikingly modern building. It sort of reminds me a little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright before uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. This was built in 1898. The architect is Joseph Maria Albrecht. And it's it's hard to see, but there is text over the door that translates to, to every age, it's art, to every art, it's freedom. And what's most important about this building is that it was the first dedicated permanent exhibition space for contemporary art of all types. So painting and sculpture, graphic arts, decorative arts, it all came together here in the entire West, which is kind of amazing. So it just, it, it gave physical form and a geographic space to this movement. And this kind of narrowing down that, that distance between sort of the fine arts and, and the decorative arts. So this idea of creating a total work of art that originated by painting architecture, it all kind of comes together very nicely here. But what's important to know is that from the Berg Theater to the Vienna Secession, that's like the space of a decade, uh, Gustav Klimt goes from being really like a pillar of the establishment to the hero of the avant-garde. And I think in part it's because of Emily Floge in this new freedom that, you know, the members of uh, the male members of his family, these other artists, uh, they weren't necessarily judging him. He is living his own life at this point. So I wanted to quickly show you two um, versions of a poster that he made for the Vienna Secession's first exhibition. And right off the bat, we can see a, another palace Athena, another goddess of wisdom here. And notice how she is juxtaposed to this blank space. It 
almost looks like a blank wall here with a cornice on top. And that sort of reminds me of the building that we were just looking at, but this is a very modern composition, just allowing for this blank white space to serve uh, this purpose, creating this, this tension with the margins and the top of the picture. At the top, we have another classical um, reference here. This is Theseus fighting the Minotaur. So even though they're for the avant-garde, even though they're for modernity, it's not that they're rejecting the past, they're just interpreting it in new ways. And you've probably already discovered what's different about these two works. And it is that Theseus's body has been censored. Um, the Vienna censors actually said, you have to put a few trees st strategically placed over Theseus's body here. So of course, this is the sort of thing that just incenses Gustav Klimt and presumably the other members of the Vienna secession because they're here for artistic freedom. So let me introduce you to um, the first of many great Klimt paintings here. And we'll see along the way that so many of them have a lot of gold in them even before we get to the gold period proper. So this is a painting that is all about Klimt's favorite subject, the female nude. <laughs> so this is a tall skinny painting in real life. And then this is just a detail of her face over here. So this is called Nude Veritas. It's from 1899. This is a work that's sort of done in response to that censoring that we just talked about. So Nude Veritas, the naked truth. This is symbolism in art. <laughs> and notice the text here, this font that he's using. This is all very, and even like this ethereal redhead with the long hair. This is all very Art Nouveau. Um, even these um, kind of abstracted golden tendrils behind her, these are the forms of the Art Nouveau. So he's integrating all of these things, but he's finding his voice in it too. So, um, so the naked truth, what is the naked truth? Well, it's this beautiful woman and she is alluring and she's looking out directly, seeming like directly at us or through us with this eternal gaze. She's got these beautiful daisies in her hair. She's actually holding up a mirror, if you're wondering what that is. But um, the naked truth is also a little bit dangerous. He painted the snake down here, kind of coiling around her, her, um, her ankles. Of course, anybody who doesn't sugar, sugarcoat the truth probably knows that, um, that the naked truth can be very dangerous. And then, um, and then the, the big element here that just scandalized all of Vienna was that Gustav Klimt included her body hair here. And this was just something that was not done. It was so over the top. I mean, you can imagine today too. I mean, people would still kind of re respond strongly if there was like a big award show and, and a woman had um, a lots of visible body hair in the same way. But people in Vienna around the turn of the century really just couldn't handle this. It was way too much for them. Uh, the text here is from a German poet named Schiller. And it translates to, if you cannot please everyone with your actions and your art, you should satisfy a few. To please many is dangerous. All right. Well, we're going to continue on with this theme of naked redheads with this next work, which is called Hope One from 1903. So we're headed into the, um, to the 20th century now. This is the full length painting over here on the right. This is just a crazy detail of this painting here. So once again, we're looking at a female nude this time with a big swollen pregnant belly that we see in profile to emphasize that swollen belly. And once again, this is something that just did not happen in art before Gustav Klimt. When's the last time you saw a naked uh, uh, female nude in art? I mean, we, we're, we're accustomed to seeing pictures of maybe Mary pregnant, but she was never naked. <laughs> so this was considered an affront. Um, also, she has visible body hair too. And so once again, this was considered a scandal. This was considered pornographic. Um, this was, uh, uh, we know who the model was for this particular painting. Her name was Herma and um, one of, she was one of Gustav Klimt's favorite models. He was quoted as saying, uh, as describing her as having a backside more beautiful and more intelligent than the faces of many other models. <laughs> so clearly he cared for her, but there's no um, evidence to say that this was his child that she was carrying. So you, so she has her hands kind of crossed over the top of her belly, sort of close to her heart. And she's looking out at us, sort of up and out at us, this direct gaze. She has little flowers in her red hair too. And there is, um, 
there's a sense of hesitancy here, but also maybe like a little bit of confidence too, because she is turned her head away from all of these terrifying things behind her. And so let's look at these faces for a moment because they are terrifying. This is supposed to be disease. This is old age. The skull, of course, is death. And then this creeper over here is madness. And she is rejecting that. Hope means, um, you know, with, with the promise of life within that, all, like, that you turn away from that and just imagine the best possible outcomes. Now, you might also be wondering, what is this big black blob here? This is actually <laughs> supposed to be a sea monster, apparently. These are its eyes. These are its teeth. And then it sort of swirls around her, sort of like that serpent that we saw in the last image. And it even seems to have these claws, those claw, the form of those claws are echoed over here in this blue element, almost as though they're kind of uh, um, moving towards her pelvic area. So the threat to that new life. And probably the idea for this picture came from the fact that Gustav Klimt had at this point already lost one of his children. Um, this is a posthumous portrait that he created of his son Otto just the year before. So um, so clearly this idea of the vulnerability of new life was already on his mind. And, and this woman's uh, figure was a way for him to kind of explore those feelings that he was having. Now, one last, well, two last great scandals as we wrap up this section here. Uh, Gustav Klimt and his former colleague Franz Mach were invited to do a series of murals at the University of Vienna, another major commission. They got this commission at the end of the 19th century and it sort of stretched out um, into the, the first few years of the 20th century. And once again, they were painting oils that were uh, oils on canvases that would have then been affixed to the ceiling. So he did a few panels for the cycle of murals and they were exhibited. And once again, people lost their minds <laughs> over these pictures. And I have to say, I, I think out of all of these pictures, these are probably the most scandalous. So he was assigned a couple of like high-minded ideas. He was going to paint philosophy. He was going to paint medicine. He was going to paint jurisprudence. And if I asked you to guess, like, what is this a painting of? You might be struggling to think. This is, in fact, medicine. Um, we've got this wonderful woman in um, sort of dra drenched and draped in gold down below with the snake in her hand, um, sort of a, a nice reference to like symbols for medicine. But beyond that, it's just like a sea of naked bodies. This redhead over here with the really long hair sort of thrusting her pelvis out at us. Again, all this visible body hair. And the rest of this almost just looks like an orgy. It's really hard to, to make out what's happening here. And so people said, this is straight up pornography. I mean, there was such a rejection of this that these paintings never even made it to the ceiling. And this is just his painting for medicine. So there's also the other two that he did. Um, and uh, sadly, none of them exist to this day because uh, they were being stored in a different building. And as the Nazis were leaving Austria in 1945, they set fire to that building. So, um, so uh, this is like the best reproduction we have here. So uh, Gustav Klimt, you know, he comes out of this scandal, he's kind of licking his wounds, but he's ready to kind of thumb his nose at the Viennese society really. And he does so with this painting, he does a lot of kind of erotic images of women as like sea serpents, lots of women kind of swimming around with their hair flowing in this Art Nouveau style. But this particular image he called um, originally To My Critics. Um, this was painted in around 1902. And the idea here is we just see this woman's bare backside. She's sort of laughing over her shoulder at us. So it's a way to say, you know, screw you to your critics. Um, eventually he changed the name to the goldfish. <laughs> just to kind of soften it, I guess. So the goldfish is going to be our segue into the gold period proper. And this is like the culmination of his career. So this is a luminous period that lasts for about a decade. There are no hard and fast like beginnings or ends to this. Um, because as we've seen, we, there's already like a little bit of gold slipping into his painting early on. Um, but these paintings that we're going to be looking at are some of the best known paintings in the world and some of the most expensive paintings in the world. So this guy out there wearing a caftan, <laughs> just rejecting modern, uh, uh, well, rejecting society's views of how he should act. 
he's doing something pretty remarkable. Now, this first image I'm going to show you is not a Gustav Klimt, but it is something that greatly inspired him. Uh, right around 1903, he, um, he took a couple of trips to Italy. He went to Venice and he went to Ravenna. And in those places, he got to see Byzantine mosaics like we see here. So mosaics just being these tiny colored glass tiles um, and the formation of picture just out of like using these tiles as like pixels here. And the gold obviously made an impression. Once again, these kind of eternal stairs that he was already interested in, the, the decoration, the flatness, all of this has a huge um, impact on Gustav Klimt. So, comes out of, of an experience like that and he's creating works that look like this. These are two paintings that once again sort of bridge that that um, that that hurdle of like the 20th century. So on the left we have Pallas Athena. Once again, it's like the third time we've seen her. This dates to 1898. It's generally considered his first official gold painting. And then after that we'll, uh, we'll get to his depiction of Judith and Holofernes, which dates to 1901. So there's just about uh, three years here. So let's start off with Pallas Athena just for a second. So there's plenty of gold here with the helmet, with this kind of stylized armor that kind of flattens out her body with the spear that she's holding. And in some ways, she looks almost androgynous, right? But she's got this eternal gaze as well, maybe more of a, a piercing stare. She is holding a tiny figurine of, um, of Nike or victory. So that makes sense in terms of, of of Athena at war, there's an abstracted battle scene unfolding in the background. It's a little bit hard to make out, but um, an extension of this armor, we can see kind of creating a flattened motif back there as well. Uh, notice how her arm is kind of out to the side like this, almost in like a position where you might be like flexing a bicep. This is a position of strength, certainly. Notice how when we look over at Judith, it's almost the opposite of that, right? But with, um, with Pallas Athena, we have a figure who is, um, is, is strong. We have a figure who's a little bit androgynous, although we do see this long hair here. So the gold is there. Let's turn our attention to what happens when we get to the 20th century with Judith and Holofernes. Now, Judith is, of course, a biblical figure that has been a, um, a favorite for many artists over the centuries. Judith is um, a, a woman who essentially saves her people by seducing the head of the army that was laying siege to her people. So she finds his tent, she seduces him, and then of course beheads him. And there is that head. Um, and <laughs> in Gustav Klimt's version of Judith and Holofernes, she is still stuck in the seduction phase, right? There's no evidence of a grisly murder here at all. Um, she's still um, looking very sultry for all the world. <laughs> so she's got these like heavy hooded eyes. They're almost closed. Her, her lips are parted here. And of course, her breasts are exposed. Well, we can see one and then the other one is visible through this transparent drapery that she's wearing. Um, there's such an emphatic flatness to this picture with the stylized flattened uh, uh, gold background here. And then even the stylized gold patterning on her clothes that it, oh, it always makes me feel like she's lying in bed. Like we are looking down at her, which kind of fits in with this sultry vibe that she's got. So she's wearing a very tall necklace here. And we'll see that that is the style in Vienna at the time. Also the way her hair is arranged is on um, this big pile of, of, of hair on top of her head. That was a modern day style too. So here she is supposed to be this biblical heroine, but there's all these things that kind of pull her in to the present, making this um, a really unusual depiction of Judith. Now, we saw before that uh, in the 1890s, Klimt was uh, creating these realist portraits, but with a little bit of abstraction. Uh, at, once he gets into his gold period, it's, it's almost like the reverse. <laughs> a little bit of realism, a lot of abstraction. And this wild painting over here on the right is like, the missing link <laughs> for him and, and, and the gold period. This is a 1906 portrait of a woman named Fritza Riedler. And it's at the Belvedere Museum in, um, in Austria, I believe. She was a 46 year old woman. We don't know much about her. There isn't a photograph of her that exists to this day, but we get the sense that, um, that her face is painting, painted very naturalistically and her eyes 
are drawn to her face, certainly, because it almost looks like there's like it's surrounded by a mosaic. Um, and then there's like that repeated pattern over here and then little pieces um, sort of floating in the back wall that look like a mosaic. It draws our eye right in. Let's kind of zoom in there. We've got a, a mosaic for comparison. Uh, we're going to get a little bit closer to Fritza Riedler, actually, so that we can see how Gustav Klimt painted that geometric abstraction that seems to be framing her face. I love this geometric abstraction on its own. I love those colors. I love the forms. And it's such a striking juxtaposition from the realism of her face. Uh, it, it And really, like nothing like this had ever been done before. Uh, there are art historians that think that this form that is framing her is sort of reminiscent of um, some Egyptian styles and even some Baroque era ways that royalty would uh, wear their hair that, that Gustav Klimt might have seen at local museums. But let's face it, I mean, his interpretation of this is all his own. So it almost seems like we have this tight, compact mosaic here surrounding her head. And then there are elements of it that have just kind of uh, broken free. We've got like this loose constellation of, of uh, these blue and white mosaic tiles on this back wall. Now, in addition to that, she is sitting in a three-quarter profile in this armchair uh, that is dense with this patterning. And he's done something unusual with this armchair. Uh, even though it's at a three-quarter profile, he is not attempting to create the illusion of foreshortening in the way he's arranged that pattern. So the whole chair reads as flat to our eyes. And this is important as we move through the gold period. And of course, some art historians think that the little uh, motif that he's using here is, um, is one that can be uh, connected back to um, to like a, an erotic reading, like th that it has something to do with female anatomy. But I mean, whether or not you accept something like that, it, the patterning of it is so important here. Now, this brings us to the gold. There's this stripe of gold down the edge of this painting. And notice that he draws a line through it. You've got like two tones of gold and that line really corresponds to her head right here. So we've got this kind of wonderful organization in the painting. And then we've got this, sort of orange background, and then a little bit of relief from all these warm colors with this blue carpet down at her feet. And now, of course, you have to acknowledge this dress that she's wearing, um, this uh, wild, wonderful, multi-tiered uh, uh, gown that she's in with these silk or satin elements here, the bows around her. It certainly looks like something that Emily Floge would wear or even design. So perhaps in this case, it was uh, another um, collaboration between artist and his friend and muse. So Fritza Riedler is like the painting that helps us understand how we get to the woman in gold, how we get to the portrait of Adele Blockbauer one, which is of course, one of the most famous paintings in the world. This is a work that he um, that, that he painted uh, around 1907. And this is a photograph of his subject, Adele Blockbauer from right around that time. So we can see that he's really captured this kind of ethereal look to her face, these heavy lidded eyes, that updo that, that she um, apparently frequently wore and then we see, you know, these little elements, these, this little peak of her flesh, but also the, the very elaborate jewelry as well. Now, interestingly, okay, before, before I get to uh, a little bit more about Adele Blockbauer, just the, the, a few statistics here. This painting of Adele Blockbauer is rather grand in scale. It's about four and a half feet by four and a half feet. And this is gold. This is gold leaf. There's even some silver in this painting, but um, but the gold leaf, these very thin um, sheets of gold have been applied to this painting and he's also painting in oil over the, the gold. So um, so it's a, it's a strange thing to do, right? I mean, in the history of art, the only time artists have ever created an image like this was to create an image of a religious icon, to create the, the, uh, the image of, of the divine. 
and gold signified a heavenly, otherworldly background. And a person who's standing in front of this kind of gold was a saint. It was somebody that you should worship. So what a format to steal or to update for the modern era. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into this a little bit more closely. I, it is worth noting that uh, Adele Blockbauer was also the model for the Judith painting that we saw before. Um, and you might be wondering, okay, so was there a relationship there with Klimt? Because obviously she was in various, varying states of undress around him. Well, we do know that she was married. It was her husband that paid for this portrait. So, um, so I tend to think that there, there wasn't necessarily an affair there. I, there's no affair documented, I should say. So, um, but there is this sort of longstanding relationship over several years. Now, Gustav Klimt spent more time or created more sketches for this portrait of Adele Blockbauer than any other work that he ever made. So it, it is a breakthrough work for him. This is just one of those sketches, which I find so interesting because in this imagining of this portrait of her, I mean, it's still based in realism. It's still based on the woman that he sees across the room sitting in a chair. And obviously he breaks free from that and he, and he discovers something totally novel here. So let's focus for a moment on this portrait of Adele Blockbauer. Um, maybe you never even noticed <laughs> that she is also sitting in an armchair like Fritza Riedler, who we just saw before. Here are the edges of that armchair. So, uh, um, and that swirling pattern is seen over here once again, and even up here at the top. It's hard to see that she's sitting. Her body doesn't look like she's sitting, but she is enthroned. Um, the gold pattern, all of this flat gold patterning makes, um, makes the picture seem very flat. And sometimes it makes it hard to understand the contours and the edges of things. Some things are clear. We see that she's wearing this elaborately patterned gown. Um, and it, at first it might look like she's got this very skinny, very uh, uh, small silhouette here. But then you see that there's like this swirling cape that goes around it as well. So uh, we're just kind of glimpsing the inner dress and then the outer cape here. And then we have these decorative straps. Um, a fun detail is that her initials are painted into the cape. So here's an A, here's a B, there's a lot of Bs. Here's another A and some Bs over here, Adele Blockbauer, um, right there. Of course, the, the inner dress here has almost like a an ancient Greek evil eye motif to it. And art historians sort of see other suggestions of female anatomy and some of the uh, uh, other decoration on her dress. So as we move a little bit further up the canvas, there, there's, um, there's a lot of confusion here, I think. Um, but we can see that he is drawing our eyes towards her face in much the same way that he did with Fritza Riedler. There's this oval behind her. Maybe it's like an elaborate collar to her dress. Maybe it's just something that he's dreamed up. Inside the oval are more ovals. There's like black and gold and, um, and silver and blue. It, these are just lovely colors. And, and so we don't quite know, is it real? Is it imagined? Those ovals give way to tiny little golden squares and big golden and red and, and gray squares over here. It's just hard to know exactly what these elements of the picture are but it provides this kind of visual splendor here. And then there's this wonderful counterbalance of just this one square over here that's practically the same color as her very pale flesh. Down below, we get this one little breath of green away from all of this gold. And if we hadn't seen Fritza Riedler before with that little breath of blue, I would have just interpreted this as a very flat wall. But now we see she's in an armchair, she's in a room probably, um, even though this is a picture that seems otherworldly and emphatically flat, there are some elements of it that are kind of grounded in realism. Now, another detail that I love just because, you know, I work in PowerPoints and with the PowerPoint grid, you can kind of see how an artist imagines a whole picture. So the center line, the axis of this picture actually runs along this bent arm of hers <laughs> and that bent, uh, the bent elbow and the bent wrist. So her, all of her flesh is just kind of contained in this upper right quadrant there. And then the rest of it is just, is given over to all of this stylized drapery and patterning here. Now, these two works were exhibited together in 1907. 
and there was a very negative reaction to it. Uh, they were described as mosaic-like wall grotesqueries, bizarre absurdities, vulgarities, and one critic even quipped that Adele Blockbauer one um, was more like was more black than block, <laughs> which apparently the black translates to brass. So she's not all golden, she's more brass. Um, nice little play on words there. Now, there is a, an afterlife to this painting that I think is just so incredible. And I'm sure most of you have heard it before. Uh, Adele Blockbauer um, passed away. This painting stayed in her family. And then when the Nazis invaded Austria, uh, they they were stealing artwork um, that was part of their military campaign. And this painting was taken right off of the walls by the Nazis um, uh, uh, out of the home of, of the Blockbauers and then uh, put in this museum called the Belvedere Gallery in Austria. Um, that's what the Nazis did with this painting. They actually tried to um, trying to distance this, this, uh, the, the Jewish identity of, of the sitter here by renaming the work, the woman in gold or the dame in gold, the lady in gold. And that's how she was known. And that's where she existed for about half a century. And during that time, she became the face of Austria. She became the favorite painting of Austria. She was the Mona Lisa of Austria. There was a Barbie doll <laughs> of her. <laughs> but in fact, uh, the Nazis did not abide by, well, the Nazis stole the painting. And so the rightful heir of the painting, this niece of Adele Blockbauer, a woman by the name of Maria Altman, right around the year 2000 decided she was going to fight to have this painting and several other Klimt paintings that were in her family's collection collection restored to her. It was a seven year long legal battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And eventually Maria Altman won these pictures back. Can you imagine like the French state ever like giving away the Mona Lisa? This was a hard fought battle. And when she got these paintings back, she auctioned off several, including um, including the woman in gold, which went for, well, she sold it, I should say. It went for a record price at the time of $135 million. She sold this painting to the son of Estee Lauder, who was a businessman and art collector, on the condition that this painting always be on public view. So it's at the new gallery in New York City. You can still go and see it. Um, Part of the fame around this case and the woman in gold um, is, is the fact that other Klimt paintings that were a part of that restitution, including the portrait of Odell Blockbauer II, also by Gustav Klimt, um, was also sold. And the person who bought it in 2006 was Oprah Winfrey. She bought the second portrait of Odell Blockbauer for $88 million. And then Oprah just sat on this painting for about 10 years. She would loan it out to other museums and that sort of thing. And then she decided to sell it in 2017. And she earned an additional $60 million off of that sale. So this painting was, was sold in 2017 for about $150 million. And of course, all of that fame is, really goes back to, I think, the, the golden painting, which is probably, I'm sure, valued way more than that these days. So a uh, fascinating kind of afterlife to, um, to the portrait of Adele Blockbauer. But we have to, we, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about this painting in, in Gustav Klimt's gold period. One of the most famous paintings on the planet. This is known as the Kiss, but it was called The Lovers from 1907 to 1908. This is still in Austria. We all have to plan our bucket list trips to Austria now. Um, this is a painting that just gleams with all of this applied gold leaf. And you can see like the individual squares and rectangles of gold leaf that have been applied here. Um, it gives it this this aura of majesty and preciousness. The son of the gold engraver, of course, knew that when you make something gold, it makes it a cherished object. Um, and this is a cherished object. This is a shining testament to the very notion of romantic love. I always joke, this is the poster that is in like half of all college campus uh, dorm rooms <laughs> all over the world. So what we see here, of course, is an embracing couple. They're both wearing golden robes, but it also seems like there is this golden envelope 
that um, that encompasses them and their loves. Their robes are distinct from each other. Once again, you could sort of read into like some erotic imagery in here that he is wearing this gold that's covered with erect um, rectangles here in, in gray and white and black. And her robes um, have this kind of oval motif that sort of looks like flowers. There's also flowers in her hair and um, laurels, uh, he's wearing a crown of laurels here too. Now um, they are, they're sort of tightly entwined here. He bends over the woman sort of cupping her face to kiss the side of her cheek. And she may be intoxicated by her companion at this moment. Maybe this is the, the throes of ecstasy. She seems as though she might be like leaning into this loving embrace with one arm wrapped around his neck up here, as we can see. And they are kneeling together in, um, in this field of flowers. And the fact that they're kneeling, art historians love that. They love to sort of suggest that these two have just consummated their love. But I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that they are on the edge of a cliff. They're on the edge of this precipice. In fact, her feet are kind of hooked over the edge of it and her toes are digging in here. What does that mean? What would it mean if they were to fall? Is that, is, would that be the act of falling in love? Is that what is about to happen here? So um, like that portrait of Adele Blockbauer that we just looked at, this is a painting that kind of bridges this gap between realism in the faces um, here and in some of this flesh and modernism in all of this flat abstraction here. Now, uh, uh, a sketch that he made sort of contemporaneous to this painting is uh, over on the left. And we can't say for sure if it's a, if it's a sketch for this painting, because he did a lot of embracing couples at this point. But because they are also standing on the edge of a cliff, I, I tend to think that it is like an early concept for the kiss. And we can see it's the couples, they're, they're intimately intertwined here. They've got their robes and their distinct patterns, but there's a choice here that Gustav Klimt made and eventually abandoned. And I think it's for the best because he was originally thinking that the woman's bare rear end should be poking out of this embrace. And you know, everybody would have said, this is pornographic and got all upset with him. So eventually he just decides to keep the, the, this couple fully clothed. Now there's a lot of speculation in terms of who this couple is. And I am sort of a fan of this theory that it could be a self-portrait of Gustav Klimt with Emily Floge, because we know that at one point he did have feelings for her, but that 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 probably cooled into a, a platonic relationship. And so here is somebody who is um, who is showing us this sense of romantic love, but perhaps it's an unrequited love. And I think um, sometimes you can get into, well, I, I think you can get into uh, the gestures and the poses here and read them in, in surprisingly different ways. Like what at first glance seems like um, sort of a consensual embrace here, perhaps it's something that she's resisting. I mean, her head is sort of angled, uh, uh, strangely here, it's sort of resting on her shoulder in an unnatural position. One of her hands is on his hand as though maybe she's trying to control it. The other hand almost looks like she could be scratching at his neck. Um, is, is she trying to resist what um, his, his uh, amorous advances here? Is that why they've backed up to the edge of this cliff at this moment? So, um, so there's there's all sorts of ways to read this, and I think um, I I think having that ambiguity makes this picture so exceptional. It's it's part of the reason that um, we we kind of wonder about it forever. Now, when this painting was first exhibited in 1908, it was universally celebrated as a masterpiece. And from what I understand, it wasn't even finished, but it was immediately purchased by the King of Austria for a whopping sum um, of 25,000 crowns, which in today's money would be like $250,000. So his days as a controversial figure were over. Maybe it's because he didn't have any pornographic backsides, um, but he hadn't sacrificed his core beliefs in order to get here. He's still expressing these um, 
the deep enduring power of the human emotion and desire through his art. And the fact that this painting still retains its immediacy and its emotional impact today is a testament to this artist's extraordinary achievement. So I've got one last gold painting to show you and then we'll wrap up quickly. This is a picture that was called the uh, uh, Vision, um, but then later kind of retitled or is popularly known as Hope too. So it does sort of seem like the an updated version of, of that image of hope that we saw before. Another pregnant woman, in fact, it is the same model we know. Um, and in this case, the skull has moved from something she's ignoring to something she is acknowledging. And of course, that skull is right there at the swollen uh, belly. But this is like Klimt's greatest hits altogether. It's abstract patterning. It's the nude female body. It's the gold background. It's all there together. But still, there's like this wonderful ambiguity because it allows you to do a little bit of interpreting on your own. Notice how there are these three women down below and their heads are all bent and their, their hands are raised and their fingers are extending upwards. And this woman who is pregnant here at the top um, also has her head bent and her hand raised, but her fingers are kind of curled down. And I think that's why people started to call this hope again, because even though there seems to be the certainty, there's something that she's holding onto here. And it's such a it's such a powerful image that way. So it is once again, Klimt dealing with, with life, with death. Um, and that's going to be our segue to Klimt's uh, death and legacy. Now, um, he became a highly celebrated artist during his lifetime. He had like honorary memberships and degrees and that sort of thing. But I must admit that towards the end of his life, he, he became pretty eccentric. He was very isolated and he basically just began to draw female nudes and nothing but female nudes. And it really sort of crossed the line into like erotic female nudes. And those works are seldom exhibited and I wouldn't show them to, to you in, in mixed company. So here we are looking at, um, at Klimt's death mask. He died in 1918 at the young age of 55. Um, he died as a, he was a, a uh, he had the the he was part of uh, one of the <laughs> casualties of the flu pandemic of that year, um, and what always kind of breaks my heart is this man who lived this very independent life. I mean, he had his female companion, but I mean, he he really lived a life according to his own desires and principles. Uh, apparently, his his very last words were send for Emily. So there's that romantic ending to his life, um, Emily being such a large figure um, throughout his entire career. Now, he did not have students per se. He didn't have a workshop. There were uh, uh, young artists who were studying to be just like him, but he did nurture the careers of a few artists, most, notice, most notably um, Egon Schiele. And these are two of his works. This is Schiele's uh, portrait, unfinished portrait of Gustav Klimt wearing the caftan. And this is actually a portrait that he made um, of Gustav Klimt the day after his death. So Sheila um, also became a celebrated artist for his erotic imagery, figure, figurative imagery. And, um, and just a few years after Klimt, Klimt debuted The Kiss, Sheila did his own kind of interpretation of The, the Kiss, kind of tongue in cheek. It's called The Cardinal and Nun. Um, Sheila actually also died in the flu pandemic of 1918. So we lost a lot of creative people that year. Um, and since then, especially I think since the fame around the case of, um, of the portrait of Adele Blockbauer, there's all of these um, artists today who are really interested in kind of updating or re-examining Klimt's work. So this is a photographer reinterpreting um, the Fritz of Riedler painting. Here is another photographer kind of staging the, the scandalous mural of, of medicine. And, um, and then you can see little references to Klimt uh, throughout modern society, even with the, um, the still fairly new portrait of First Lady Michelle Obama by the artist Amy Sherald. You can see little elements of Adele Blockbauer. Look at that bent wrist and the bent elbow, and then just using all this geometric patterning to flatten out the image, right? <laughs> so we end with Gustav Klimt and just a couple of big ideas here. That idea of going from rags to riches, of sort of weather 
gathering and maybe even inviting all of these scandals to then kind of emerge as this um, truly creative person making these totally novel paintings that still connect with people over a century later. Um, in so many ways, he um, he's a, a truly astonishing artist. So um, so we will end tonight uh, with uh, maybe a newfound love and respect for uh, this this real <laughs> individual um, uh, person who who really marched to his own drummer both uh, personally and professionally. So we'll end there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments that you have about Gustav Klimt. I will start looking at the Q and A here. Um, Marsha asks, who did the painting of Vienna at the beginning of the slides? Let's see if I have that in my notes. Um, good question. I should have credited that. I do not have that in my notes. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm sure if you were to Google like a painting of Vienna from 1890, that is really what would come up. That's that's like the key image in, in Google. Um, Alana said, were they both considered weird? Great question, Alana. And I think, yes, <laughs> they were definitely outside of the norm. What is kind of interesting is that, um, well, I actually, I can show you a few of these images right at the end here. I still have some of those landscapes that I so wanted to include, but look at this. Um, they would be, he and Emily Floge would, they'd vacation together. And, you know, sometimes he'd be wearing a caftan and sometimes they just look like regular people. So I think, um, I think they weren't weird all the time, maybe, which is kind of fascinating. Ellen said, who else was a member of the secession? To be honest, Ellen, um, nobody, <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there weren't a lot of other uh, very recognizable names. Um, I, I was like reviewing the list the other day and I was like, I, I'm not even going to mention these artists because their names weren't familiar to me, um, but you could find a good list of them just on like the Vienna Secession uh, Wikipedia page. So I'm sorry, I don't have their, their names handy in my mind, but they're, they're kind of lesser known artists. Um, somebody asked, why did, classical nude paintings have a lack of body hair? This was just the academic tradition. This is a really good question. And it kind of goes all the way back to like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. If you think about it, you think about like the sculptures that you would see in a museum. I mean, they're just classicized. Everything's idealized. There's never body hair for women. It's just been the standard for so long. Um, and it's kind of funny to think that a little hair could, um, could cause so much controversy, but that is the case. Alana asks, were the naked models considered prostitutes of sorts? That's a good question. I didn't come across anything about that in my research. Um, I will say that he was oftentimes sort of suggesting in the titles of his works and sometimes in the intimacy of the figures that, that some of these women were lesbians, but, and, and I think that that was another kind of scandalous aspect to these works, but prostitutes I hadn't seen. Um, although of course they were paid models, so you could you could make the case um, potentially. Uh, Marsha asks, wasn't it odd that a Jewish matriarch like Adele Blockbauer would pose in states of undress for Klimt? Yes, <laughs> Marsha, that's a great question. I find it odd too. I mean, I don't know much about uh, Adele Blockbauer. I did watch that great movie, Woman in Gold, um, starring Helen Mirren. And um, and in Viennese society, it was essentially like a, a Catholic society. Klimt himself was raised Catholic, um, but religion didn't really seem to factor too much into his adult life. But then there was like this upper echelon of, of like Viennese society that was Jewish. And part of like establishing their 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 place in the pecking order was like to commission art. So um so yeah it it, it seems like a particularly like freewheeling thing to do to do, especially for like somebody who's in this upper echelon of society. I can't quite account for why she why she did it, but you bring up a very good question. Now now we all have to like come into or dive into um, Adele Blockbauer's life a little bit better now. Who owns Adele to now? I believe it was a Chinese businessman who bought it. Uh, Nancy asks, please tell me ha have you have a lineup for 20 2024. All, all of my programs for 2024 are on my website, which is I am culturally curious 
lineup.com. And I just posted them the other day. I think you'll like the lineup, although uh, Gustav Klimt too is not up there, but maybe for 2025. Uh, Madeline says, he seems very influenced by Japanese flat painting and pattern. Absolutely. That's a reference that I didn't even get into, but you, you can see like there's all of this kind of cross-cultural stuff that's happening between like Egyptian motifs and ancient Greek motifs. It's all in there. And Japanese is definitely in there. I'm sorry I didn't um, point that out, but uh, you're so good to do so. So thank you for doing that. Um, somebody else asks, are there are any of Klimt's works viewable in New England? Great question. Nothing comes to mind, but if anybody uh, knows better uh, than me on that, please feel free to jump in. Um, Ron said, joined a bit late, um, how was he viewed by the Impressionists of France and Netherlands? Did he have a relationship or contact with them? Paintings are very different, fisheye influence in a lot of the works. Uh, interesting and curious. Ron, what a great question. Uh, as far as I know, Gustav Klimt was, I, well, I get the sense that Vienna was kind of insular. So I'm not even sure <clears throat> how much exposure he had to art outside of Vienna. We know he liked the mosaics, obviously, but did he even know about Picasso in, in, like, in the early years that he's doing these gold paintings? Um, I, I, I'm not even sure. So I'm not sure if the Impressionists were, would be aware of him. He came a little bit later. So how much, how aware was of, of the Impressionists was he? It's hard, it's hard for me to say. <clears throat> he studied art in like the 1880s. So, um, so Impressionism by that time was fairly accepted. Um, it was like the post-Impressionists that were kind of coming up at that point. But I, 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 I don't think that was the kind of training he was getting. So a uh, great question. I'm sorry, I don't have a concrete answer for you. Mary said, please explain further how the geometric pattern flattens out the picture. I don't understand what you mean. Thank you so much for asking then. Yeah. <clears throat> the geometric pattern here in any one of his pictures, um, there's no aspect of it that is rendered in a way that it has shadow or depth to it. So it is a flat pattern. It's almost like taking like the pattern of a dress and hanging it on, on a wall. There's no illusion of depth there. I'm sorry, let me have a quick drink here. Um, <clears throat> that's really what I mean by uh, the, the, the geometric pattern flattens out the picture. It, um, where, there, where there could be an illusion of depth, uh, like, for example, we see like one breast behind the other over here. Uh, the flesh looks like it's rendered with an illusion of depth here, but the this drapery here flattens that out. Mary, I hope that explains that um, in, a, in, in a clear way. I'm not sure if it did. <laughs> uh, somebody asked if I'm teaching now and I am teaching right now to you. I'm not teaching with the university right now. I find this um, a lot more fun and I don't have to grade any papers, which I really appreciate. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Uh, when did he do his landscapes? I got a beautiful book about, um, about the library showing them. The landscapes, they're so wonderful. Um, he did them all throughout. So he basically he would go on vacation every summer with Emily Floge and her sisters. And he was known as like this hobgoblin of the woods. He would just like spend all this time outside painting. And the landscapes are just, they're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. I, I fell in love with those painting with, with those landscape paintings before I even realized I was in love with them because like in my first home, I purchased for like above the fireplace, a Gustav Klimt landscape. I just loved it. And then as I'm doing all this research, I'm like, oh, he's been in my heart for such a long time. Um, let's see here. Somebody else asked, what happened to his estate upon his death? Great question. With all these kids, how did it all play out? Well, half of his estate went to Emily Floge, and the other half was divided up amongst the women who basically went to court and said, my child is a descendant. And there were only six, six kids that were counted as descendants at that point. So this idea of 14 kids could be a little apocryphal, but generally speaking, it's acknowledged. He had 14 children. We know at least one of them died, um, but there were really only um, the mothers uh, representing six children who petitioned for part of his estate uh, upon his death. And then Alice asked, did his parents live to see his success and his nudes? Oh, great question. Um, I'm not sure. His, well, obviously his father um, died uh, 
fairly young in the 1890s, but his, he lived with his mother his whole life. So I believe she was actually still alive when he passed away. So she would have seen his success. I'm not sure if she saw the nudes, um, especially the erotic ones that he was doing at the end of his life. That's a great question. Um, Melody, you're here tonight. Great to see your name. She says, um, were the secessionists related to the ones in England? Rennie McIntosh. Great question. I don't believe they were related. Um, they probably had similar belief structure, like the things that they were advocating are, are fairly similar. Um, but I think they were kind of happening independently. I didn't see um, references to, um, to what was happening in England. And then uh, somebody else asked, will, will the recording be here? Yes, uh, Chelmsford Library is so great about recording the programs and sending it out to everyone, even people who missed tonight's program. So um, I think it's Abby uh, shared a very nice compliment and I very much appreciate it. Marsha said, do you do other presentations we could attend? Yes, Marsha, I'm off for about a month now. Happy holidays, everybody. But you can go to I Am Culturally Curious and you can see my programs that are coming up um, in mid-January. And there's a whole mix of them. And like I said, uh, I think a very exciting slate of programs for, for um, 2024. Mary asks, in the last picture of Pallas Athena, there was a gold face on her chest. Was that part of her armor? Mary, that's how I interpreted that. Um, you could fly back to Pallas Athena. It's making that kind of funny face. And, um, and sometimes you do see that in armor. It's almost like a way to, um, intimidate your rivals and uh, <laughs> distract and intimidate to have a face like that. I think that's part of the armor. Um, okay. And so I think we got through all of the questions. There's like 60 things in the chat and wow, everybody, you're so sweet. I love these. <laughs> Thank you so much for these kind words. Um, <clears throat> okay. Samantha says, I've been to Austria and visited and seen many of the things and places. It's truly magical. Thank you for sharing that, Samantha. It, Austria is now on my bucket list. And it seems like like every museum it, um, in Vienna kind of has like a little bit of, of Gustav Klimt. So it seems like there's plenty to see and do there. We all have to start planning this trip. <laughs> Alana says, uh, those two famous wealthy people wearing their shirts. <laughs> um, was Emily a redhead? I, you know, I don't know if I've seen any colorized photos of her, Sarah. That's a really good question. I want to say she was just to make it true that that's her in the kiss painting, but I, I don't have any defi anything definitive to base that on. There might be photos out there of her that are uh, in color, but I can't say for sure. And thanks for joining us tonight. And she said, some of these paintings remind me of collage. Absolutely. It's um, it's right in there with the mosaic motif too, like this idea of like little bits kind of coming together, especially with Adele Blockbauer, that really sort of mismatched dense patterning all behind her head here. It, it feels like collage. That's a that's a, a great note. Um, Lori says, it looks like you modernized the patterns of Emily's choice of clothing. I'm not quite sure what that means, Lori, but um, I'm now I'm curious. <laughs> thanks for adding it in there. Um, thanks for the compliments along the way. Did any of his children turn out to be artists? Sharon asked. Sharon, I'm not entirely sure. I My hunch is that that's not the case because I feel like that would have been a pretty big story. Um, but I, it, that's not definitive, <laughs> but I, I believe they did not. Um, Judy's here tonight. Hi, Judy. Thanks for being here and your question and your kind words, I really appreciate that. Um, all the kind words that are in here. May I take a screenshot of the side-by-side -side portraits of uh, including Michelle Obama? You absolutely can, although I was a little mortified because I don't have the best um, resolution on that Michelle Obama painting. But if you can take a, a screenshot, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, you can also find a better resolution image online. I, I'll have to update that. Um, Let's see here. Did he have an addiction problem? <laughs> Diana, I think you might've hit the nail on the head with that one. <laughs> it's, pro it's, probably, it's probably the case between the cats, the women. It seems like that could be true. 
Judy says, what's a good book to look at um, on his work? Uh, Judy, I usually try to put together a good bibliography uh, at the end of my programs and I failed to do that this time around. I apologize. I don't have one off the top of my head that I can share with you, um, but Gianna might be able to help you out with that. Uh, Gianna from the Chelmsford Public Library. Diane, thanks for your kind words. Polly says, do you know if Michelle Obama's dress was actually like that or if it was the artist that created it? That I do not know. Um, she had such or has such an incredible sense of style. I I suspect that that dress probably exists, but I don't know. Um, I'm gonna have to look into that, Polly. That's a great question. <laughs> oh, we have a request for Clint landscapes. I think we're gonna have to do it. Um, there's a, oh God, he did so many other things too. All these allegories. It's really interesting stuff. Um, did he ever marry? Nope. He would not settle down. I think he was having too much fun. <laughs> um, thank you so much, all these kind words. He may have painted her naked without her posing. Oh, Melody's comment. And I think you're probably talking about Adele Blockbauer there. Um, that could have been the case. Maybe he had another model and he just liked her face. Um, Abby, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming tonight and your very, very kind words. It's like you were just like, ending my year on such a high note and it means so much to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, has there been a movie about his life? If not, who would who would you cast to play him? Ooh, that's a great question, Jeff. I don't know who I'd cast. Um, for some reason, Harrison Ford popped into my head, but I don't know why. Um, a movie about his life. Of course, in Woman in Gold, they only touch on him like for a microsecond. I think there is another movie though that kind of focuses more on him. I can't say for certain. Maybe somebody else who's here tonight has seen something. Um, but that would be that that would be a pretty uh <laughs> smoking movie because his life was so crazy. Wasn't it rumored that he had an affair with Adele Blackbauer and some of the other women he painted? He definitely had um romantic uh, or sexual relationships with many of his models, but I can't, I don't know for sure about Adele Blockbauer. Generally speaking, that is not acknowledged in most of um the research in any of the research that I, I did for this. Um Stephen. Thank you so much for your kind words. Disarmingly charming laugh. I'm going to be using that line in my program descriptions. <laughs> what happened to his estate? Oh, I think we got to that. Um, we'd love to see his landscapes. How do you spell Emily's last name? F-L-O-G-E. Floge. I might be pronouncing it wrong. I'm so happy everybody had a great time tonight. Oh, yes. And you can visit his home outside of Vienna. Be interesting to know if it smelled like cat. <laughs> uh, did I purchase an original for my fireplace? Jack. <laughs> I'm an amateur art historian. No, unfortunately not an original. Um, but I did go through a website called 1000 Museums and the reproductions that you can buy through 1000 Museums, uh, a portion of your purchase goes back to the museum itself that houses that particular work of art. So you're supporting you're supporting the arts and doing that. That's that's a, a good place to shop for reproductions. Um, Athena's armor often depicts Medusa in the press pit. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's probably the case, right? Um, that's Medusa on Athena, goddess of world wisdom. Thank you everybody for filling in that gap there. Um, <laughs> Judith looks amazingly like Joan Crawford. Thanks for saying it. Uh, thank you so much for these kind words. Let's see, I remember a store in Vienna that only sold replicas of Gustavo items. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was like, he, he's like the, um, literally the golden child of Vienna. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Frank's here tonight. Frank, thanks for your kind words. Everybody, wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Jack says Johnny Depp as a potential actor. I really like that. <laughs> All right. I think I got to everything. I don't know if I've missed any questions. Um, I would guess Emily's name is pronounced Flog. Okay, thank you, Agnes. Okay, I think we got, I think I saw everybody's very kind words and I 
very, very, very much appreciate you being here tonight and um, and for giving me such such nice feedback. I'm going to just ride this positive wave right into 2024. You've really made my night. So thank you so much, everybody. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Really great presentation. Very much looking forward to 2024's lineup. So like Jane said, please go to I'm culturally culturallycurious.com to check that out. Um, I will let folks know that the next one in the lineup for January 2024 is on January 27th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame. So everyone, please join us for that one next month. Um, yes, we will be sure to send out um, a recording of this presentation to y'all tomorrow or early next week. Um, if you have any questions about books or movies or anything like that, I can see if I can get some down for um, Jill, our programming librarian, tomorrow before she sends out the email. If I can't, please feel free to always call the library. We're more than happy to take your questions on that and see what we can find for you. So thank you folks for bringing that up as well. Um, and Jane, thank you so much again. Um, looking forward to next month. All right, everybody, we'll have a great couple um, holidays coming up and I uh, hope everyone has a really nice new year. Take care. Bye, Happy everybody. holidays.